the scope of scientific research. Although the EU GDPR explains that the purpose of scientific research should be interpreted in a broad manner and includes privately funded research, the, this explanation, I think, is not intended for the commercial purposes for product development. This does not mean that this kind of data processing is allowed without the consent of data subject or other legal basis. At present, it is not uh, appropriate to determine whether the purpose of scientific research includes commercial or industrial purposes. I believe that there exists a possibility of flexible interpretation of the scope of scientific purpose, provided that technical and organization safety measures, such as encryption or pseudonymization, are implemented. Uh, I will talk about how to uh, develop internationally accepted standards on data protections. Uh, some people say that uh, uh, Convention 108 and uh, 108 Plus could serve as a basis for a global standard in uh, data protections. Uh, but the, we don't know much about the Convention we, uh, 108 and 108 Plus. However, the Korea's Data Protection Act has referred to the uh, OECD principles and uh, EU's 1995 directives on the pro data protections and basically accepted the principle and the structure of the, of the above laws. Korea's immediate goal is to receive uh, adequacy decision from the European Commission. Adequacy talks are still ongoing with the European Commission. As far as I know, the Asian countries did not join Convention 108 when it comes to data protection or privacy. Different countries have different views and sensitivity. So I think it is a questionable uh, whether a form of international treaties that re restrict the national sovereignty is essential for the global standard on data protection. This, uh, the issue of data protection at the international level seems to require the establishment of practical, actual framework rather than uh, international treaty. At, uh, at the present time, 
the cross-border data transfer issues should be solved from the viewpoint of the mutual guarantee that the country to which data is transferred should properly protect the personal data of the other countries. In fact, uh, the current uh, EU GDPR and California Consumer Privacy Act and Brazilian uh, Data Protection Act suggest that the uh, uh, data protection framework of major countries around the world are becoming similar. Uh, this was for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, in-depth presentation of the situation in uh, South Korea. So I will now pass the floor to um, Mr. Abdias uh, Zambrano to have uh, an overview of the uh, situation in Panama. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here uh, this morning. Um, well, um, talking about the data protection policies in my country, it was not until March this year uh, that Panamanian National Assembly approved the first data protection law. Before, before this, regulations in data protection were scattered in different laws, as credit law, telecoms law, HIV and STDs laws, and transparency and access to public information laws. So this law on personal data protection is intended to provide citizens with a legal instrument of protection and defense. This law was discussed and underwent changes since its presentation in 2017, its withdrawal and review for the second presentation in 2018, and its approval in 2019. In its content, it protects personal data, including those that may create discrimination, discrimination such as sexual orientation, medical and genetic data, among others. In the region, there is not much difference uh, to, to Panamanian legislation. Uh, speaking about the region, we have different scenarios, but in summary, quite positive. Uh, first, we have the case of Costa Rica, uh, where since 2000, uh, 2011, they have a law on the protection of the person against the processing of their personal data. Uh, this law also created an autonomous authority specialized in the defense of personal data. Nicaragua also, <coughs> also has, um, sorry. Nicaragua also has a personal data protection law since 2012, which contemplates the right to G digital obliv oblivion in the case of the other countries uh, in the region, such as Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Some of them are currently discussing data protection laws, but in this moment right now, they don't have a regulation for that. Talking about, about the issues of relevance for our communities in the case of Panama, uh, the law was passed in its debates among the deputies quickly. It entered in for, into force in the year uh, 2021, and despite being consulted at the working table of the commission in charge of the discussion of this law, many of the civil society annotations were ignored, such as extraterritoriality and the use of existence existing authorities with limited capabilities to exercise the defense of personal rights. This law, unfortunately, does not centralize the legislation of personal data, but is a supplementary law of existing ones. We need now the active, the active participation of national civil society and international support for the regulation of this law. As a curious fact, one of the authorities that will be responsible uh, for the protection of personal data in Panama um, said it, it has not neither the infrastructure nor the human and economic resources to take charge of tasks like this. While the law takes effect, Panamanians and those who have their data collected in Panama are in serious danger. Recently, there was a, there was a security flaw where about 3.5 million data, apparently health data, were a hack, a cyber hack emergency um, where the CSIRT denied the, le the leak. Uh, today, the Panamanians uh, really don't know what happened with that leak, but much worse is the ignorance of the importance of privacy and the protection of personal data in the population. Uh, this brings us the to the importance of education and literacy in the population. For example, the population looks forward to the use of surveillance cameras, uh, facial recognition, 
among other technologies, for the supposed national security without knowing the serious danger they face. Even newborns are suffering the lack of a data protection regulation. In this moment, in several health centers, just seconds after birth, are taking fingerprints as a matter of security to avoid kidnappings and human exchange of neonates. Um, finally, how we can develop international accepted standards on data protection. First of all, I think uh, we think at the IGF, at the Panama IGF, we have discussed a lot of, uh, about the, the multi-sectoral work that we have to do and take into account, above all, the, the opinion of civil society, replicate the good practices of countries, of countries that have achieved a more robust regulation on the subject, as, such as the GDPR. And finally, civil society must create international coalitions where organizations for, from different sectors, such as LGBTIQ plus organizations, consumer organizations, among others, can give their opinions and promote public policies together with the authorities for the protection of citizens. Thank you. Thank you for this overview of the situation in Panama and some neighboring countries. Uh, we'll now pass the floor to uh, Liliana Pekova to have uh, an overview of uh, the situation in North Macedonia. Okay, um, thank you for the, uh, inviting me to this format and the ability to discuss about not only North Macedonia, but the region. Um, I'm coming from the Western Balkan region that is the countries that are not part of the EU, EU actually, and uh, we face mostly with the challenges of not having a strict data protection regime because we are not an EU country member. That means that GDPR is not implemented in the country. We have not, um, it's a prepared text. It's a uh, part of the uh, text that is going to the parliament to be adopted, but it's a very, um, no, nobody knows when it is going to happen. Um, so we are um, implementing the Directive 9546 still, and for the time being, um, we, are, uh, we have ratified the Convention 108. So the main issue from uh, our perspective is uh, whether to comply with the GDPR uh, framework or the Convention 108 because uh, in this dilemma that we have, uh, it's on, which is on a legal and uh, policy framework level, basically the GDPR is on one side uh, territorially uh, covering the, the EU citizens, which is a problem that we have on a border level for a border cross-border cooperation with the entities from the um, Bulgaria and Greece that we are surrounded as neighboring countries. And also the modernized protocol of Convention 108, which we have not signed yet. What is happening in the region? Um, Serbia just three days ago has uh, signed and ratified the, the modernized protocol of the Convention 108. And having in mind that all of these countries in the Western Balkan region are members of the Council of Europe, that means that this is or presents, um, 108 presents one international legal standard for us that could be applied in the meantime while GDPR um, is in, in accordance presented in the parliament and then adopted and implemented in the countries. So having no stronger regime uh, as the GDPR is, um, I'm afraid I will say that in these countries GDPR is more like, more like PR than the GDPR itself. Uh, we find it as a very urgent issue uh, to have these uh, discussions and because it's a dilemma in, in the region, how we are going to um, resolve the cases if there is an EU citizen uh, coming and complaining about uh, data protection uh, violation. So um, what we are foreseeing in, in the country, but mostly not on the country, in, in the region itself, is that somehow when um, it is the process of uh, entering the EU is uh, very long, so until then we are considering Convention 108, a very possible international uh, standard that could lead the way towards um, implementing uh, protection and prevention mechanisms. Um, although from one personal view, I do not agree that uh, it presents some clear um, 
let's say, uh, mechanisms in some way. In some <coughs> technical process, maybe it is more strict and more uh, clear in a way, but the GDPR from the accountability and transparency principles, it complements what actually the protocol does not have. But again, uh, our main uh, challenge in, in the country and in the region itself is that we are not a member of the European Union and we have European Union citizens in the region that we need to think about how we are going to, um, to comply with, with international standards and the European the legislation itself. Why? Uh, as I said, Greece and Bulgaria are neighboring countries uh, of North Macedonia and we have cross-border cooperation on a higher level. And uh, we have, um, in, in this past five or six years, uh, increased dental tourism, which means that there is a rise of dental um, polyclinics in, in the cross-border region that are collecting medical sensitive data from uh, European citizens coming from Greece and Bulgaria in uh, these countries that in, in North, North Macedonia especially. So um, the main dilemma here is again um, how we're going to protect the EU citizens if we do not comply with the EU legislation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for these presentation and um, two or three of you for these um, presentations. So um, the good news about having a um, relatively small panel today is that we can open the floor to have a really uh, in-depth discussion and to have more input from uh, different countries. Um, so um, we will have questions from remote participants um, um, and my colleague as an online moderator will tell us as they are coming, these questions are coming in. Um, uh, so I will open the floor uh, short, um, in a short moment um, to have your comments about what you have heard or to hear some inputs from recent legal developments on data protection from maybe the different countries that you are coming from and also on your vision for uh, what should be the global standards of data protection. Uh, but before I open the floor, um, I <coughs> was asked um, by um, Peter Kimpian from the Council of Europe, who had to leave the room for a meeting, to um, um, raise a, a comment that he would have liked to make. Uh, so he asked me to um, say that um, the um, South Korean government has expressed interest in joining Convention uh, 108 and that uh, the Council of Europe is looking forward to um, the discussions that are um, happening and that will go on with the government of um, South Korea. So this was um, his comment and now um, please uh, take the floor. So, yes, please. Uh, if, if you want, please say a few words about um, wh where you come from, who you are. Um, introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello, good morning. My name is Carol Douglas from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the Executive Officer of Legal and Enforcement at the Telecommunications Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. And I, I was quite excited to hear the presentations um, because uh, in, in main part, they reflect what is happening in, the, in Trinidad and Tobago and maybe to an extension in the region, in the Caribbean region, where data protection has taken on a new focus. As you may have realized recently, we've been the center of a controversy concerning Cambridge Analytica, where, as you would know, if you've been reading the papers, that has been an issue even in the United States, their general elections, their election, sorry, and in the UK. So we've been, um, we've focused recently on data protection. Now we do have a data protection act, which was passed in 2011, very similar to South Korea. Um, unfortunately, it's not fully proclaimed, which means that the act, the entire act is not in force. So we do not have a data commissioner or information commissioner. 
So therefore, similar to what Panama said, is that we don't have recourse. So if there's a breach of your data protection rights, uh, you don't have any remedy per se, in the sense that you cannot go to a data commissioner and seek relief from a data commissioner. You may have to take it as a private right and pursue those matters as a private individual. But to say a data commissioner is appointed and you could seek some remedy through that person or that office, that is not currently possible. At the moment, there has been renewed focus on revision of those pieces of legislation, which includes the E-Trans, the Electronic Transactions Act, uh, together with the Data Protection Act. And I suspect uh, regionally, um, it's part and parcel of a, a wider initiative to update the laws. And those laws, are, as I said, 2011 to now is quite some time. Technology has by far overtaken what would have been written in those laws in 2011. So given the fact that now we have the GDPR and we have lessons from well, the conventions and other countries, um, it is an opportunity to revise and revamp the laws to bring it to modernize those, those laws and probably hopefully implement a, a have a data commissioner um, so i just wanted to mention that um, if there's anything else i'll be happy to to comment okay thank you uh please remember to yeah thank you um uh, so yes, please uh, right. take the floor, um, and also, so of course, the floor is open to comments. But also, if you have questions for the panelists, uh, please. Reach Hi, out. I'm Luis Castro. I'm a member of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the CGR.pr, and I listen from the colleagues uh, here about their experience in different level of uh, implementation of laws, uh, data protection laws, like we heard from Panama. Uh, Macedonia, North Macedonia, but uh, I am quite interested in ask uh, our colleague from South Korea, uh, as a developed country and very highly techno te techno technological country, integrating the OCDA, uh, how is it uh, really effect if the the law? is really effective in South Korea and if people in general are aware of the rights and how, uh, how the system works in terms of implementation and enforcement. You, you also talked about imprison imprisonment uh, penalties and I'd like to know if this uh, really occurs and if you have any case that you can bring us. Thank you. Thank you. So we already have um, one question and, and one comment from well, Peter Kimpian from the Council of Europe, even though he has left uh, directed um, to a question about uh, South Korea. So maybe I will um, give the floor back to um, Mr. John Ingyun for a um, brief answer. <laughs> uh, thank you. I think the Data Protection Act is a give a, a positive effect on the every uh, every area of the society. The people are, are very conscious of the, uh, protecting the my uh, uh, their con their right, and the companies should comply with the uh, stri strict. I think is a comply the law, and, uh, and and therefore the level of the level of protection is advanced after the implementing the uh, D, uh, Data Protection Act. But uh, the negative effect, effect has uh, exist, uh, such as the, the penalty, uh, the imprisonment. <laughs> uh, there is no uh, precedent other countries don't have. Uh, so the we have uh, many uh, positive effects or negative effects on that. So we are, I think, uh, we are having a discussion of, uh, about uh, how to improve our law and uh, secure the uh, stability and uh, uh, effective law. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you. And any more inputs, comments, questions? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jimson Olufuye. I'm from uh, Nigeria. I run an IT business and a uh, member of the Africa ICT Alliance. Uh, I apologize that I came in uh, a little late. Well, of course, uh, you know, I know the subject matter is about data protection. So I just want to give us a little uh, information. Uh, perhaps a number of you might be already aware uh, with regard to uh, data protection efforts uh, in the, my region, in Africa. Um, April this year, uh, we have the data protection regulation in Nigeria, and uh, it makes some provision to protect citizens, basically, uh, citizen data, and for them to, be, to have the opportunity to give authorization uh, before their data is used, of course, data privacy. And uh, it makes uh, a con data controller to be an owner to be accountable, uh, and also the subject matter, uh, the, the subject, that's legal subject or natural person is protected. And uh, it makes some pro uh, penalties, make provisions on penalties, uh, like uh, if you are a processor, processing uh, more than 10,000 uh, data subjects, and uh, there's a breach, uh, you have to be liable to about 2% of your uh, gross income of the preceding year. And if it's less than that, it'll be 1% of your uh, income the preceding year. Uh, the, it's the implementation is on right now, and uh, it's giving room for job creation in the ecosystem, and uh, there's some kind of activity in terms of uh, protection of citizen data. Uh, right now in Nigeria, you know, ICT is contributing about 13.8% uh, to uh, GDP, and so it's a really serious business. Kenya also uh, recently, I think it's uh, last week or so, passed, or last two weeks, passed the Data Protection Act. and. Uh, the same provision, but uh, the difference between the art of Kenya and Nigeria is that in Nigeria we already have an agency, uh, National Information Technology Development Agency, set up in uh, 2001 to at least steer the development of ICT in Nigeria. So they came up with the regulation. It's in their mandate to come up with such regulation. And uh, but for Kenya, Kenya has provision to create a commission uh, with a commissioner uh, to oversee the implementation. And they have prison terms, maybe five years for those that breach the, uh, the act or need to pay some, maybe uh, some uh, millions of shillings or so. Uh, but I gather now that there is a provision to make it more accountable because Appointing a commissioner, if it comes from the civil service, then surely it is going to be compromised. So I think there is a kind of uh, a litigation to ensure that the appointment of a commissioner to oversee that uh, is independent. So when it's independent, you'll be able to act uh, without any form of compromise. So those are the two, uh, at least, regulation or acts that uh, on data protection that is uh, within my region that I know. But the question I want to ask is, um, maybe I missed some part of uh, the, the discussion earlier, is um, uh, is there any level of collaboration between the GDPR, uh, EU, and uh, the AU, that is African Union, and uh, of course the Nigerian and Kenya uh, data authority. And of course we know the African Union has a data protection uh, uh, advisory, you know. So that, that is a question. Perhaps uh, maybe someone can uh, respond to that. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comments and the question. Um, is there, maybe I will take, if there are uh, one or two more questions and then I will um, give them back to the panel. Well, if there are no other 
question for the moment then does then, yeah. yeah let's go back to the western balkans so in, in, I just wanted to explain that in terms of not having the, the, the strong legal framework in the country and in the region presents not only us, but uh, the European Union a challenge how to deal with it. But again, um, in, in my analysis, um, and I have previously worked five years for the Data Protection Agency in the country and 10 years uh, within the law enforcement for Ministry of Interior. So uh, what gave me the insight is that mostly businesses and IT companies are aware uh, of the need to have a stronger regime and implement implementation and enforcement uh, mechanisms. Um, and very much absurd to say, but public institutions, or although they are um, huge data collectors and controllers, they are not implementing on that level, on a very high level, the data protection regime. So what we found and what I have made an analysis in, in the previous um, year is that we do have um, nomination of um, data protection officers on a high level, but again, we do not have information officers uh, nominated in, in each entity. So that presents a kind of um, a challenge, but also uh, a threat to the data protection within one entity. And what intrigued me more is that over 65% of those DPOs in the public and private entities are women. So um, what I have done in, in this, uh, let's say, intriguing analysis is that why women are mostly nominated as data protection officers. Are they uh, more reliable on, on data protection mechanisms? I don't know, let's see. But I have come to a conclusion that maybe we could do some different targeting. Um, I've contacted the Women uh, Entrepreneurs Organization, uh, talked to them and invited them to an um, uh, event of uh, data protection challenges and talks and discussions. So what we have done is that we invited all of the SMEs that are run and managed by women to actually come forward with the data protection challenges that, that we have. So in this cross-border region, now we are working, my organization is working with the SMEs and uh, the women organizations that are actually enforcing, implementing already GDPR challenges, although we do not have a legal framework with it. So we came to a conclusion that we can do it, although we do not have like a past law in the parliament, but we can technically implement GDPR requirements, which uh, we have translated into technical requirements. So GDPR on a policy level, on the procedures and processes, but then again, we worked with the ICT companies that were more than willing to, to contribute and to develop some ICT um, tools, GDPR tools, that actually helped these women into, into implementing and enforcing uh, GDPR uh, on a small scale level. So there is a way, there is a, uh, uh, you know, there is a side way always, but we need to find it. And it's a matter of, of time when this legislation will, um, you know, come first or come second. Um, my position and this morning when we discussed it was that, yes, we have to agree upon one international data protection standard. But when I was hearing my colleagues here is actually we need to uh, you know, start talking in, in parallel with the information security as well. So um, on the other hand, the country, although it's not EU member country, but is very much progressing towards becoming in a very um, next moment, let's say, a NATO country. NATO membership, so this uh, brings us forward with the cybersecurity regime. Within the national strategy of cybersecurity, we were forced, let's say, um, to take measures into bringing information security on a higher level. In a way, let's say, that could complement what we are lacking of in a, in a technical um, requirements from the GDPR. So, you know, we are struggling, but we will be there soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So your your message is uh, we can imp um, we can still apply what is the essence of the GDPR even we while we are still waiting for. 
I have a question, if you allow me. You mentioned the Ministry of Interior, the Minister of Interior would be a entity or a person where they could address the data protection. Um, I'm confused, it, but that is not uh, an issue anymore because it's, it's kind of a controversial between, and I have worked in both sectors, it's kind of, you know, service to the citizens, but data subject rights, and the Ministry of Interior is the huge, the, the biggest actually controller of, of personal data. But that's the result, right? It's not an issue anymore. You said that... Uh, you, you need to... Yeah. I, can you rephrase it, the question in short? Yeah. You mentioned that the mm. Minister of Interior mm. was in uh, an issue, and to be the data protection mm. uh, nominated person who will address the question? Sometime, you mentioned something about it. Uh, in the, uh, at this time and in the past, uh, in the past. Okay. yeah, <laughs> I, I say, okay. yes. yeah. Thank, thank you. So um, I don't have that much time left, so I would uh, invite maybe people from the audience to ask, um, raise some last questions um, that we'll take together, and then I will pass the floor back to the panelists to have a um, final concluding words. So. Uh, a short question, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, just again on the Carol Douglas. Uh, um, so South Korea mentioned something about the the prosecution of violations of the Data Protection Act, which I found quite interesting. You mentioned that it's quite unique that you have in your territory the actual ability to have somebody sent to prison, a custodial sentence. Uh, other countries may impose a fine a certain percentage of the gross. Um, how have you, now I always believe that if you don't have a proper enforcement mechanism, if you don't have a good strong data commissioner, then there's no use in having a data protection law. Uh, it, it goes hand in hand. If you want to enforce the rights, you have to have a very strong data commissioner, or uh, DPA. So in your case, I was uh, hoping when my, my friend asked the question whether or not you actually had such prosecutions or has your Information Commission or Data Protection Agency implemented fines or custodial sentences in the, in the past to enforce data protection laws? So I will uh, maybe ask before you can answer if there are any other questions from the room. Maybe on the right, nobody has asked anything yet. No? Okay. Well, in that case, um, uh, I will give the floor a um, lot of interest in uh, South Korea today. <laughs> so I will give you the floor to answer the question very briefly, and then I uh, will make a final round for concluding remarks. Thank you. The, uh, <coughs> the, da the data protection authority in Korea usually uh, the sentenced uh, in fine, usually fine, not uh, imprisonment, but uh, regulations said uh, uh, the violator uh, should have been uh, should have put in prison uh, theoretically, but uh, usually have the fines. the The criteria between the imprisonment and fine is not clear. <laughs> it's not clear, but uh, so the uh, usually usually we can the DPA uh, take the uh, imprisonment uh, not uh, the take the fine not uh, imprisonment, yeah. Yeah, yeah, fines, yeah. Mm, the penalty fine, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, a lot of things uh, to talk about. Um, um, what's striking is that we can really see and feel in this room how data protection has become a global uh, issue and more and more countries have their own data protection laws, if we had had this session five years ago, the, uh, it would have been a completely different discussion. So this is really interesting. Um, according to uh, Graham Greenleaf, which is a, who is a leading expert um, academic in the topic, there are now 132 jurisdictions that have adopted some sort of data protection acts. Now, of course, uh, he includes the United States in his list, so um, I would have questions for him <laughs> had he been here about uh, what type of acts he includes in the list. Um, but so we need to look at the content as well. But there seems to be a relatively high degree of convergence nonetheless. 
So I will pass the floor back to each of the panelists for some brief concluding uh, remarks, uh, perhaps uh, what the takeaway message from this discussion can be, and uh, also, as this was one of the questions um, meant to be discussed in this um, session, uh, what do they see um, looking forward as uh, being able to be, uh, form the basis of a global standard of uh, data protection uh, worldwide? So first, maybe, um, Mr. Abdias Ambrano, uh, if you want to have a, say a few words. Thanks, Julian. Uh, well, I would like to say that Panama and the whole Central American region where Ipanitec, uh, the NGO uh, where I work, uh, that region is working hard, uh, trying to <coughs> deal with data protection. It's something new to uh, all the citizens also for the government, but we need, we do need help of organizations from other regions, their examples, their experiences, uh, to put pressure on our politicians and policy uh, makers as well. None of the countries of the, in the region have ratified Convention uh, 108, for example, uh, commonly being very small countries uh, between two major lands as North America and South America, uh, we are forget in the decision making, but do we, we do we exist and appreci appreciate spaces like this to expose our situation and to find great allies in our struggle? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, perhaps some concluding words from Liana Bekova on Yes, session. thank you. Um, Adopting an international uh, data protection global standard would help the countries which are not part of um, either EU, either Council of Europe, I don't know if, you know, not belonging in some regions or communities uh, would increase the possibility to foster and develop economies because not having um, data protection subject rights regime and data protection regime implemented as GDPR will impact the countries and the regions, especially in economic growth and development, especially when we are talking about cross-border corporations. So um, I would um, support my colleague um, uh, from Panama um, suggestion to have international, or we should gather like this uh, multi-stakeholder approach from civil societies and governments also to uh, include and to adopt one global standard for data protection. Also, I would um, increase this, uh, let's say, um, suggestion to have um, financially independent uh, data protection uh, agencies or self-regulatory bodies that would monitor and that would uh, actually monitor actually yes data subject rights uh, enforcement because it's very important to have independent self-regulation in the countries about data protection regimes in order not to supplement this uh, penalties or imprisonments or you know what different strong techniques thank you thank you so uh, if i understand you correctly um say that uh it is necessary to um, have maybe a, a, a convention, which might be different than Convention 108, but at least some sort of uh, document that would serve as common ground? No, I, I wouldn't say new convention. It's enough from conventions, let's say, but to increase the, the level of independency of the bodies within the country, whether it's in data protection ombudsman or agency, data protection agencies, or what kind of uh, different bodies in the country that regulate data protection regime we need to increase the level of their financial independence in order to be able to uh, monitor much uh, more the data protection subject rights. Yes, yeah, so, okay, so global standards are important, but we need enforcement, and for that we need to support strong and independent data protection authorities. Okay, so I think this seems to be a common ground for even many of the questions that would raise, so that is maybe something for the um, uh, report that we can include. Um, thank you. So, last but not least, because there has been a really strong interest in South Korea, um, Mr. John Ning-Yung, please, for the final, final concluding yeah. words. Thank you. 
First, I'm very pleased to hear the good information that our government is considering designing the Convention 108. Um, I'm, stu I'm studying these issues after returning home. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my my concluding mm, remarks is uh, personal data is, uh, data is one of the human rights to be properly uh, protected and is also uh, means to help industrial development and personal convenience. There is a cultural challenges that we, we Koreans are facing here. The South Korea has been had been under military regime for a long time, and there had been. Uh, many human rights abuses in those days. Since personal information can be a tool to track a specific individuals, many Koreans are concerned that the use of personal data by the government and corporation may cause the human rights abuses. Uh, this cultural and psychological obstacle must be overcome. And uh, I think the, the people's op opinion about uh, uh, current uh, data protection is, is positive in general. Uh, so the, uh, the, the uh, personal data should have been used in many ways, provided it is protect, it protected properly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now that's impressive. I think this is the first time I've ever been to any conference, and especially being an academic, where I see that we finish with even one minute and fifty-four seconds left. So. Uh, please join me in uh, applause to the panelists for this extraordinary performance and for the uh, insightful contributions. Thank you.